Ladies and gentlemen, please meet David Sedaris. Hello, and welcome to my little world. <laughs> this is a story I wrote shortly after moving to France in 1998, and it's called Pick a Pocketoni. It was July, and my boyfriend Hugh and I were taking the Paris Metro from our neighborhood to a store where we hoped to buy a good deal of burlap. The store was located on the other side of town, and the trip involved taking one train and then switching to another. During the summer months, a great number of American vacationers can be found riding the metro, and their voices tend to carry. It's something I hadn't noticed until leaving home, but we are a loud people, the trumpeting elephants of the human race. <laughs> Questions, observations, the locations of blisters and rashes. Everything is delivered as though it were an announcement. On the first of our two trains, I listened to a quartet of college-age Texans who sat beneath a sign instructing passengers to surrender their folding seats and stand should the foyer of the train become too crowded. The foyer of the train quickly became too crowded, and while the others stood to make more room, the young Texans remained seated and raised their voices in order to continue their debate, the topic being, which is a better city, Houston or Paris? It was a hot afternoon, and the subject of air conditioning came into play. Houston had it. Paris did not. <laughs> Houston also had ice cubes, tacos, plenty of free parking, and something called a Sonic Burger. <laughs> Things were not looking good for Paris, <laughs> which lost valuable points every time the train stopped to accept more passengers. The crowds packed in, surrounding the seated Texans and reducing them to four disembodied voices. From the far corner of the car, one of them shouted that they were tired and dirty and ready to catch the next plane home. The voice was weary and hopeless, and I identified completely. It was the same way I'd felt on my last visit to Houston. <laughs> Hugh and I disembarked to the strains of Texas, our Texas, and boarded our second train, where an American couple in their late 40s stood hugging the floor-to-ceiling support pole. There's no sign saying so, but such poles are not considered private. They're put there for everyone's use. You don't treat it like a fireman's pole. Rather, you grasp it with one hand and stand back at a respectable distance. It's not all that difficult to figure out, even if you come from a town without any public transportation. The train left the station, and needing something to hold on to, I wedged my hand between the American couple and grabbed the pole at waist level. The man then turned to the woman saying, P.U., can you smell that? That is pure French, baby. <laughs> he removed one of his hands and waved it back and forth in front of his face. Yes, indeed, he said. This little froggy is ripe. It took a moment to realize he was talking about me. The woman wrinkled her nose. Golly, peach, he said. Do they all smell this bad? It's pretty typical, the man said. I'm willing to bet that our little friend here hasn't had a bath in a good two weeks. I mean, Jesus Christ, someone should hang a deodorizer around this guy's neck. The woman laughed, saying, you crack me up, Martin, I swear you do. <laughs> it's a common mistake for vacationing Americans to assume that everyone around them is French and therefore speaks no English whatsoever. These two didn't seem like exceptionally mean people, Back home, they probably would have had the decency to whisper, but here they felt free to say whatever they wanted, face to face, in an normal tone of voice. It was a way someone might talk in front of a building or a painting they found particularly unpleasant. An experienced traveler could have told by looking at my shoes that I wasn't French. And even if I were French, it's not as if English is some mysterious tribal dialect <laughs> They happen to teach it in schools all over the world. There are no eligibility requirements. Anyone can learn it, even people who reportedly smell bad, <laughs> despite the fact that they've just taken a bath and are wearing clean clothes. Because they had used the word froggy and complained about my odor, 
I was now licensed to hate this couple as much as I wanted. <laughs> this made me happy as I'd wanted to hate them from the moment I'd entered the subway car <laughs> and seen them hugging the pole. Unleashed by their insults, I was now free to criticize Martin's clothing, the pleated denim shorts, the baseball cap, the T-shirt advertising a San Diego pizza restaurant, sunglasses hung from his neck on a fluorescent cable, and the couple's bright new his and her sneakers suggested they might be headed somewhere dressy for dinner. <laughs> Comfort has its place, but it seems rude to visit another country dressed as if you've come to mow its lawns. <laughs> the man named Martin was in the process of showing the woman what he referred to as my Paris. He looked at the subway map and announced that at some point during their stay, he'd maybe take her to the Louvre, which he pronounced as having two distinct syllables, Louvre. <laughs> I'm hardly qualified to belittle anyone else's pronunciation, but he was setting himself up, acting like such an expert. Yeah, he said, letting out a breath. I thought we might head over there someday this week and do some nosing around. It's not for everyone, but something tells me that you might like it. <laughs> People are often frightened of Parisians, but an American in Paris will find no harsher critic than another American. France isn't even my country, but there I was, deciding that these people needed to be sent back home preferably in chains. <laughs> in disliking them, I was forced to recognize my own pretension, and that made me hate them even more. <laughs> the train took a curve, and when I moved my hand further up the pole, the man turned to the woman saying, Carol, hey, Carol, watch out. That guy's going after your wallet. What? Your wallet, Martin said. That joker's trying to steal your wallet. Move your pocketbook to the front where he can't get at it. She froze. And he repeated himself, barking, The front! Move your pocketbook around to the front! Do it now! The guy's a pickpocket! <laughs> the woman named Carol grabbed for the strap on her shoulder and moved her pocketbook so that it now rested on her stomach. Wow, she said. I sure didn't see that coming. <laughs> well, you've never been to Paris before, but let that be a lesson for you. <laughs> Martin glared at me. His eyes narrowed to slits. This city is full of stink pots like our little friend here. Let your guard down and they'll take you for everything you've got. Now I was a stink pot and a thief. <laughs> it occurred to me to say something, but I thought it might be better to wait and see what he came up with next. <laughs> Besides, if I said something at this point, he probably would have apologized, and I wasn't interested in that. <laughs> His embarrassment would have pleased me. But once he recovered, there would be that awkward period that sometimes culminates in a handshake. I didn't want to touch these people's hands or see things from their point of view. I just wanted to continue hating them. <laughs> so I kept my mouth shut and stared off into space. The train stopped at the next station. Passengers got off, and Carol and Martin moved to occupy two folding seats located beside the door. I thought they might ease on to another topic, but Martin was on a roll now, and there was no stopping him. It was some a-hole like him that stole my wallet on my last trip to Paris, he said, nodding his head in my direction. He got me on the subway, came up from behind, and I never felt a thing. Cash, credit card, driver's license, poof, all of it gone, just like that. I pictured a scoreboard reading Marty, zero, stink pots, one. <laughs> And I clenched my fist in support of the home team. <laughs> what you've got to understand is that these creeps are practiced professionals, he said. I mean, they've really got it down to an art, if you can call that an art form. I wouldn't call it an art form, Carol said. <laughs> art is beautiful, but taking people's wallets, that stinks in my opinion. <laughs> you got that right, Martin said. The thing is that these jokers usually work in pairs. He squinted toward the opposite end of the train. Odds are that he's probably got a partner somewhere on the subway car. You think so? I know so, he said. They usually time it so that one of them clips your wallet just as the train pulls into the station. The other guy's job is to run interference and trip you up once you catch wind of what's going on. Then the train stops, the doors open, and they disappear into the crowd. 
if Stinky there had gotten his way, he'd probably be halfway to Timbuktu by now. I mean, make no mistake, these guys are fast. I'm not the sort of person normally mistaken for being fast and well-coordinated. <laughs> and because of this, I found Martin's assumption to be oddly flattering. <laughs> Stealing wallets was nothing to be proud of, but I liked being thought of as cunning and professional. I'd been up until 4 a.m. the night before, reading a book about recluse spiders, but to him, the circles beneath my eyes likely reflected a long evening spent snatching flies out of the air, or whatever it is that pickpockets do for practice. <laughs> the meatball, he said. Look at him, just standing there, waiting for his next victim. If I had my way, he'd be picking pockets with his teeth. An eye for an eye, that's what I say. Someone ought to chop the guy's hands off and feed him to the dogs. Oh, I thought. But first, you'll have to catch me. <laughs> It just gets my goat, he said. I mean, where's a polizioni when you need one? <laughs> polizioni? Where did he think he was? I tried to imagine Martin's conversation with the French policeman and pictured him waving his arms, shouting, That man tried to pick up my friend's pocketoni. <laughs> I wanted very much to hear such a conversation and decided I would take the wallet from Hugh's back pocket as we left the train. <laughs> Martin would watch me steal from a supposed stranger and most likely intercede. He'd put me in a headlock or yell for help, and when a crowd gathered, I'd say, what's the problem? Is it against the law to borrow money from my own boyfriend? If the police came, Hugh would explain the situation in his perfect French while I'd toss in a few of my more polished phrases. The guy's crazy, I'd say, pointing at Martin. I think he is drunk. Look at how his face is swollen. <laughs> I was practicing these lines to myself when Hugh came up from behind and tapped me on the shoulder, signaling that the next stop was ours. There you go, Martin said. That's him. That's a partner. Didn't I tell you he was around here somewhere? They always work in pairs. It's the oldest trick in the book. Hugh had been reading the paper and had no idea what had been going on. It was too late now to pretend to pick his pocket, and I was stuck without a decent backup plan. As we pulled into the station, I recalled an afternoon ten years earlier. I'd been riding the Chicago L with my sister Amy, who was getting off three or four stops ahead of me. The doors opened, and as she stepped out of the crowded car, she turned back to yell, So long, David! Good luck beating that rape charge! <laughs> Everyone on board turned to stare at me. Some seemed curious. Some seemed frightened. But the overwhelming majority appeared to hate me with a passion I had never before encountered. That's my sister, I said. She likes to joke around. I laughed and smiled, but it did no good. Every gesture made me appear more guilty and I wound up getting off at the next stop rather than continue riding alongside people who thought of me as a rapist. I wanted to say something that good to Martin, but I can't think as fast as Amy. In the end, this man would go home, warning his friends to watch out for pickpockets in Paris. He'd be the same old Martin, but at least for the next few seconds, I still had the opportunity to be somebody different, somebody quick and dangerous. The dangerous me noticed how Martin tightened his fists when the train pulled to a stop. Carol held her pocketbook close against her chest and sucked in her breath as Hugh and I stepped out of the car, no longer finicky little boyfriends on their overseas experiment, but rogues, accomplices, halfway to Timbuktu. <laughs> When it comes to being written about, my dad is an incredibly good sport. That's why I dedicated my third book to him. One day, he'll open it up, and when that happens, I think he'll really be touched. <laughs> this is called, I'll Eat What He's Wearing. 
We're in Paris, eating dinner in a nice restaurant, and my father is telling a story. So, he says, I found this brown something or other in my suitcase, and I started chewing on it. <laughs> thinking that maybe it was part of a cookie. Had you packed any cookies? <laughs> my friend Maya asks. My father considers this an irrelevant question and brushes it off, saying, not that I know of, but that's not the point. <laughs> so you found this thing in your suitcase, and your first instinct was to put it in your mouth? <laughs> well, yeah, he says, sure I did. But the thing is, he continues his story, but aside from my sisters and me, his audience is snagged on what would strike any sane adult as a considerable stumbling block. <laughs> Why would a full-grown man place a foreign object into his mouth, <laughs> especially if it was brown and discovered in a rarely used suitcase? <laughs> it is a reasonable question, partially answered when the coffee arrives and my father slips a fistful of sugar into the pocket of his sport coat. Had my friends seen the blackened banana lying on my bed, they might have understood my father's story and enjoyed it on its own merit. As it stood, however, an explanation was in order. For as long as I can remember, my father has saved. He saves money. He saves disfigured sticks that resemble disfigured celebrities. <laughs> and most of all, he saves food. Cherry tomatoes, sausage biscuits, the olives plucked from other people's martinis. <laughs> he hides these things in strange places until they are rotten, <laughs> and then he eats them. <laughs> I used to think of this as standard Greek behavior until I realized that ours was the only car in the church parking lot consistently swarmed by bees. <laughs> My father hid peaches in the trunk. He hid pastries in the tool shed in the laundry room, and then he wondered where all the ants were coming from. <laughs> Opened the cabinet in the master bathroom, and to this day you will find expired six-packs of Sego, a chalky dietary milkshake popular in the late 60s, <laughs> crowded beside liquefied nectarines and rock-hard Kaiser rolls. The cans relax, dented and lint-covered, against the nastiest shaving kit you have ever seen in your life. <laughs> there are those who attribute my father's hoarding to being raised during the Depression, but my mother was not one of them. Please, she used to say. I had it much worse than him, but you don't see me hiding figs. <laughs> <coughs> Reference to figs was telling. My father hid them until they assumed the consistency of tar. But why did he bother? No one else in my family would have gone anywhere near a fig, regardless of its age. There were never any potato chips tucked into his food vaults, no chocolate bars or marshmallow figurines. The question asked continually throughout our childhoods was, who is he hiding these things from? <laughs> Aside from the usual insects and the well-publicized starving people in India, we failed to see any potential takers. You wouldn't catch our neighbors scraping mold off their strawberries. But to our father, there was nothing so rotten that it couldn't be eaten. It was people who were spoiled, not food. It's fine, he'd say, watching as a swarm of flies deposited their hatchlings into the decaying flesh of a pineapple. There's nothing wrong with that. I'd eat it. And he would if the price was right. And the price was always right. Because she fell for words like fresh-picked and vine-ripened, our mother was defined as a spendthrift. You couldn't trust a patsy like that, especially in the marketplace. So armed with a thick stack of coupons, our father did the shopping himself. Accompanying him to the grocery store, my sisters and I were encouraged to think of the produce aisle as an all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> Tart apples, cherries, grapes, and unblemished tangerines he was of the opinion that because they weren't wrapped, these things were free for the taking. <laughs> the store managers thought differently, and it was always just a matter of time before someone was sent to stop him. The head of the produce department would arrive, and my father, his mouth full of food, would demand to be taken into the back room, a virtual morgue where unwanted food rested between death and burial. 
Due to the stench and what our mother referred to as one small scrap of dignity, (laughs) my sisters and I rarely entered that back room. It seemed best to distance ourselves so we would pretend to be other people's children. (laughs) Until our father returned, bearing defeated fruits and vegetables that bore no resemblance to those he had earlier enjoyed with such abandon. The message was that if something is free, you should take only the best. If, on the other hand, you're forced to pay, it's best to lower the bar and not be so choosy. (laughs) Quit your belly aching, he'd say, tossing a family pack of anemic pork chops into the cart. Meat is supposed to be gray. They doctor up the color for the ads and so forth, but there's nothing wrong with these. You'll see. I've never known our father to buy anything not marked, reduced for quick sale. (laughs) Without that orange tag, an item was virtually invisible to him. The problem was that he never associated quick sale with immediate consumption. (laughs) Upon returning from the store, he would put the meat into the freezer, hide his favorite fruits in the bathroom cabinet, and stuff everything else into the crisper. It was, of course, too late for crisp, but he took the refrigerator drawer at its word, insisting it was capable of reviving the dead (laughs) and returning them hale and vibrant to the prime of their lives. Subjected to a few days in his beloved crisper, a carrot would become as pale and soft as a flaccid penis. (laughs) Hey, he'd say, someone ought to eat this before it goes bad. He'd take a bite and the rest of us would wince at the unnatural silence. (laughs) Too weak to resist, the carrot quietly surrendered to the force of his jaws. An overcooked hot dog would have made more noise. Wiping the juice from his lips, he would insist that this was the best carrot he'd ever eaten. You guys don't know what you're missing. (laughs) I think we had a pretty good idea. (laughs) Even at our most selfish, we could understand why someone might be frugal with six children to support. We hoped our father might ease up and learn to treat himself once we all left home, but if anything, he's only gotten worse. Nothing will convince him that his fortunes might not suddenly reverse, reducing him to a diet of fingernail clippings, or soups made from fallen leaves. The market will collapse or the crops will fail. Invading armies will go toward a door, taking even our condiments. Yet my father will tough it out. Retired now and living alone, he continues to eat like a scavenging bird. We used to return home for Christmas every year, my brothers, sisters, and I making it a point to call ahead offering to bring whatever was needed for the traditional holiday meal. No, I already got the lamb, our father would say. Grape leaves, phyllo dough, potatoes. I got everything on the list. Yes, but when (laughs) did you get these things? An honest man, except when it comes to food, our father would lie, claiming to have just returned from the pricey new fresh market. Did you get the beans, we'd ask? Sure, I did. Let me hear you snap one. (laughs) Come Christmas Eve, we would fly home and find a leg of lamb thawing beneath six inches of frost, the purchase date revealing that it had been bought midway through the Carter administration. (laughs) Age had already mashed the potatoes. (laughs) The grape leaves bore fur. And it was clear that when spoken to earlier on the phone, our father had snapped his fingers in imitation of a healthy green bean. (laughs) Why the long faces, he'd ask. It's Christmas. Cheer up, for Christ's sake. Tired of rancid oleo and perfectly good milk resembling blue cheese dressing, (laughs) my family began taking turns hosting Christmas dinner. This past year, it was mine, and those who could afford it agreed to join me in Paris. I met my father's plane at Charles de Gaulle, and as we were walking toward the taxi stand, a bag of peanuts fell from the pouch of his suitcase. These were not peanuts handed out on his recent flight, but something acquired years earlier, back when all planes had propellers. (laughs) 
and pilots wore leather helmets and, <laughs> and long flowing scarves. I picked up the bag and felt its contents crumple and turn to dust. <laughs> Give me those, will you? My father tucked the peanuts inside his breast pocket, saving them for later. <laughs> Back at the apartment, he unpacked. I thought the cat had defecated on my bed <laughs> until I realized that the object on my pillow was not a turd, but a shriveled black banana. <laughs> he had brought all the way to Paris from its hiding place beneath the bathroom sink. <laughs> Here, he said, I'll give you half of it. <laughs> He'd brought a pear as well and had wrapped it in plastic bags so that its pus wouldn't stain the clothing. <laughs> he had packed a day earlier, but bought long before he was married. <laughs> as with his food, my father is faithful to his wardrobe, operating on the assumption that sooner or later, even the toga will make a comeback. <laughs> he holds on to his clothing and continues to wear things long after they've begun to disintegrate. Included in his suitcase was a battered suede cap bought in Kansas City shortly after the war. This was the cap that would figure into his story later that night when we joined my sisters and a few friends at a nice Paris restaurant. So, he says, I found this brown-colored something or other in my suitcase... And I must have chewed on the thing for a good five minutes until I realized I was eating the brim of my cap. Can you beat that? A piece of it must have broken off during the flight, but hell, how was I supposed to know what it was? My friend Maya finds this amusing. So you literally ate your hat. Well, yes, he says, but not the whole thing. I stopped after the first few bites. <laughs> An outsider might think that he stopped for practical reasons, but my sisters and I know better. Because it didn't kill him, the cap had proved edible. <laughs> I would now be savored and appreciated in a different way, no longer considered an article of clothing. It would return to its native land, where it would move from the closet to the bathroom cabinet joining the ranks of the spoiled to wait for the coming famine. <laughs> <laughs>